Gospel Tangents needs your support. Please consider donating to our website, gospeltangents.com. We'll use your donation to help produce other podcasts and professional documentaries such as this. Welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Bennett. In today's conversation, we'll talk to BYU Church History Professor, Dr. Richard Bennett. We'll talk about the vision of Elijah. Did you know that it took more than 40 years for that revelation to be canonized? Why did it take so long? Back in 2011, Elder Bednar gave a, a talk about temple work, and one of the things that he cited was the uh, vision of Elijah in 1836. Um, it was kind of a surprise to me to discover because uh, that vision was actually secret for about 40 years, as I recall, and it wasn't wasn't revealed. A lot of times we think that you know this is the way it's always been done, and so it's interesting to me about how how sacred and secret, I guess, in sense, that revelation was for some 40 years. Yeah, written that A lot of people didn't, didn't, didn't know about it. Can, mm-hmm. you, can you talk a little bit about that vision? You're talking about the vision in April of 1836 yeah. of the Savior. The sealing power, because that's, that's the one. Elias. April 3rd. Moses. Yeah, I think it was April 3rd, 1836. Uh, three appeared and gave the sealing power. And in Elder Bednar's talk, one of the things that he said was, you know, when we think of the sealing power, at least myself, I think of husband and wife being sealed together. But in Elder Bednar's talk, he mentioned how we were see- being sealed back to our our ancestors. And I, you know, I think it was right before that Joseph had a vision of Alvin, um, and surprised that Alvin was in the celestial kingdom and and baptism for the dead. Although, even you know, there was no font in in Kirtland in 1836. <coughs> And so the the evolution of baptism for the dead really didn't happen until Nauvoo, but the foundations, as you said, were laid in Nauvoo. And so it's really interesting to me to see how, I, I guess, rudimentary things were in Nauvoo. And, and, you know, a lot of these visions that we take for granted today, you know, the vision of Elijah, weren't very well known, uh, in, especially in relation to temple work. Could, could you comment on that? This is a, a classic case in church history of what I would call the reclamation of revelation. And in 1876, under the specific direction of Orson Pratt, many earlier revelations that were given in the history of the church, including section 110, which you're referring to, but not just 110, section 109, which is the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, section 121, 122, 123, the Liberty Jail revelations, Sections 2 and 13, the Moroni and John the Baptist revelation. Section 132, the plural marriage, the celestial marriage section, were finally put in the Doctrine and Covenants and canonized in 1876 by membership vote. It was a reclamation of these earlier revelations which we had come to to really begin to see after 40 years. Those are extremely important and we reclaimed them. that They were always there, but they were never canonized. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it set a precedent for the church. In 1976, Spencer W. Kimball, looking back to section 138 today, our section 138, the great dream and vision of Joseph F. Smith back in 1918, it took us, what, almost 60 years to catch on to the significance of that? You could ask the question, why did we wait so long to reclaim such a powerful revelation? I remember reading that in in the book called Gospel Doctrine, which was a collection of Joseph Smith's great sermons, and wondering, why isn't that in the Doctrine and Covenants? And I'm sure others thought the same. Well, President Kimball looked back in the rest of the Twelve with with the keys of the revelation, saying, you know, that revelation is foundational to what we have to do now. And so they reclaimed it and put it in first in the Pearl of Great Price, if you recall, and then later in the Dark and Covenants in section 137, 138, Alvin's, same thing, Alvin's vision, Joseph Smith's vision of Alvin. So this idea of looking back to our history often leads to a reclamation of revelation, which doesn't deny the significance and the validity of the original revelation whatsoever, but it, it indicates how the Spirit of the Lord moves and said, that 
you better write it down. It reminds me in the Book of Mormon when Christ comes to the Nephites and he says, didn't I not tell you, did not uh, Samuel prophesy that there would be many that would rise from the dead? Remember that? And Nephi's kind of shocked. He says, oh yeah, he did say that. And Seraphim said, well, why didn't you write it down? Remember? It's right there in 3 Nephi. Write it down. And okay, we'll go down and write it down. That was the reclamation of Revelation. And that really is an open, it opens a great topic in church history about why studying our history is so important because sometimes we miss things. And I think you're, you're referring to here section 110 and these other revelations is a wonderful, Elder Bednar makes a great point of it. Uh, these sealing keys were extremely important. They were written all down by Warren Cowdery. Joseph and Oliver didn't write it down. Warren Cowdery wrote it down. Joseph never refers to that revelation if you want to know the truth. Although he talks a lot about the substance of it, but it's not until Orson Pratt in, in 76, on the direction of the president of the church, of course, we better get that down. Why, why do you think it t has taken so long? I mean, decades to get some of these foundational revelations. I don't know. But I think it's like a person's childhood. You look back sometimes and you say, you know, that was an experience that changed my life. I better give more uh, more importance to that. I better write that thing down. And when I'm writing my family history, that thing really, really, that person really changed my life. Or, you know, in retrospect, Revelation is also retrospective, not just prophetic. It's also looking back. It's, and I think that's what happened, and that's what continues to happen sometimes. We look back. And it wouldn't surprise me, Rick, for a moment, if we were to go back and say, you know, that proclamation on the family given by President Hinckley back there in 92 or whatever it was, that should go in our Doctrine and Covenants. That was revelation. It wouldn't surprise me for a moment. We'd have to go buy some new Rev Doctrine and Covenants and say, here we go again. But it's a living church. It's, it's, a, it, it's a discovery. It's discovering all the time from our past as well as our future. Well, I'll tell you what I think. You know that they should put in the Doctrine and Covenants as a new revelation. If you read the official Declaration 1, it's very business-like, very governmental. But if you read the footnote, you know, Wilfred Woodger says, I had a vision. I'm like, why are we not emphasizing the vision? I'd like to see, I'd like to know more about that vision. Uh, you know, even with official Declaration 2, I'd like to know what, more about that revelation with, with priesthood. Yeah. Um, I, you know, are there any other revelation? There's, there's one about... Uh, was it Lorenzo Snow that saw Jesus in the temple, in the Salt Lake Temple? Mm -hmm. I might, might have the prophet wrong. Or, do you know what I'm yeah, referring to? Yeah, that's... So, yeah, you know, I, I would love to see these sorts of things in the Doctrine and Covenants. And it, we need another Orson Pratt, I guess, to, to <laughs> help us write these down, I guess. Well, we have wonderful prophetic leaders today who, uh, when inspired, will, if necessary, make all the reclamations that we need and all the modern emphases that we need. Um, it is. We do believe in revelation, right? Past, present, and future. <laughs> we believe all that God has revealed. Oh, we didn't quite understand why that was so important. We do now, and he's revealing it today, just like the Savior said. Did I not tell you? Write that down. <laughs> it doesn't make the church any less true. In fact, it makes it more viable. I hope you enjoyed our conversation about this vision of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple. We'll continue our conversation, and I will ask Dr. Mark Staker why it took so long. He has a different theory. I have my theories as to why that's the case, but they're just speculation on my part. Um, but my, my feeling is that when Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph Smith and restored the Melchizedek priesthood, that it was to be a confidential event, that they taught him things and gave him instruction that he was to share with no one, and it was only to be shared within, within a certain sacred context. Could this be a good explanation for why Joseph was sealed to Fanny Alger, his first plural wife, in 1834-35, a year before the vision of Elijah? For more information, please subscribe on our website, gospeltangents.com, where you can get a transcript. You can also get one at Amazon.com for just $3. Please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, or other podcast application, and give us a review so that others can find us. 
Thanks again for listening, and we hope you continue to support us here at GospelTangents.com.